here with me today is Tim Lunsford. Tim, would you share with our church family some of the losses you've experienced in life? I've been through the loss of five close family members in four years. Um, starting in 2012, my grandmother passed away in August, and then my brother three months later, and my wife of 14 years in the May of next year, of the next year, and then her mom, my mother-in-law, um, I believe she gave up on life because they were, they were closer than just mother and daughter. They were like best friends. Um, she passed away in December of the same year, and then not the next year, but the year after that, my grandfather passed away. Wow. Tim, what were some of the things that really helped you during your grieving of these losses? The main thing that really helped me is, is my foundation in the word. Um, in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus tells his disciples that his commandments, he tells a parable, and his commandments were like the man who built his house on a, on a rock and not the sand, so that when the storms come, the rock will, will con or the house will continue to stand. Uh, so when my storms came in life, my house stood uh, firm by God's grace. And um, worship music has definitely been um, a, a very important thing, uh, especially It Is Well. That's one song that's just, God has used that to continue to worship him despite, despite the loss. Because uh, I've learned that a worship song does not become, a worship song really, is, you don't really connect to the word until you've lived that worship song. I was also doing school through Liberty University and staying focused on a goal, and that goal kept me, kept negative thoughts and defeating thoughts out. So the word, the scripture, worship music, and also having a goal that you're working toward helped you to grieve the losses. What wasn't helpful to you in the grieving of the loss? main thing that was not helpful and the Lord showed me pretty immediately is that what if questions were not helpful like what if I did this or what if I said this or whatever um, such and such that it's not helpful um, especially when my wife passed away she passed away on a day that uh, my mother-in-law was trying to get a hold of her to to go out to the shopping or something and I decided to let her sleep in longer and when I went to wake her up, she was passed away. And my mother-in-law was really upset with me that if I would have woken her up, you know, when I, she asked me that she would still be alive. And, and I told her, no, that's, that's not the way it works. Um, you know, it's, those aren't healthy thoughts that God has each one of our plans planned before we're even born. And Psalm 139, 16 confirms that your eyes it says your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book was were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them so it's not helpful to play the what if game definitely not okay so tim would you share with us how these losses how this grieving has affected your relationship with the lord that is the absolute best part um, because as counterintuitive as it sounds, it's driven me deeper and deeper and deeper into God's love. Um, with each loss, he just reminds me of how he brought me through the, the loss before that and the loss before that. And, and it's just, there, there's nothing, it, it's so great to know that there's nothing that, could happen in this life now that I've been through all this that I could ever give up on God and I could ever throw my Bible across the room um, and he is he is so awesome he is so awesome and he, he is so powerful that he will allow you to go through times of sadness and and but also give you tears of sadness but then also tears of joy as you remember and he reminds you of the strength that he's provided you to to walk uh, with him through it, put one foot in front of the other and, and walk with him. And, and 
is so perfect that he mixes tears of sadness and tears of joy and gives us a, a resolve to, to continue and move on. And that resolve came for me, uh, especially after my wife passed away. Um, I did not. <laughs> there was a time when I was cranking out two papers in one day, and, and I just had to have them that day because I... Um, because of grieving, I got behind, and and I remember like it was yesterday that I stopped. Um, I, s- I just stopped at my computer and I and I said, you know, Lord, why am I doing this? You know, I just I just want to go to heaven like every <clears throat> everyone else that's gone, and uh, I just want to I just want to stop. I just want the world to go on around me. I just want to stay in this chair. Lord just told me this I'm not done with you yet there's there's more there's there's much more and by the power of the Holy Spirit he gave me the strength to stand up and continue to move on with life and not just barely continue on it's it's so awesome that I mean I look back now I, I moved to Lynchburg after my wife passed away and and did an aviation course eight hours a day, five days a week for uh, 50 weeks <laughs> to get my FAA certification as an aviation mechanic. And then uh, continued on um, with schooling, and the Lord led me into music and worship with pastoral leadership. And both of those programs were very, very difficult. And there were times I didn't want to get out of bed. There were times I would <laughs> just literally pray and, and, and cry and, and ask for strength to continue to press on. And he was so faithful, like his word says, um, and he gave me the strength to, to press on. It was awesome, and I want to thank you for sharing about your losses with us and the strength of God that saw you through. Would you express your appreciation to him? It can be an ordinary day. And then out of nowhere, it seems you get hit by something that just rocks your world. John Ortberg says that happened in the lives of a couple named Elizabeth and Richard. Elizabeth was intelligent, engaging, beautiful. People loved her, loved to be with her. Richard was handsome, charming, successful. Elizabeth was a psychologist. Richard was a lawyer. When they got married, everybody at the wedding either was in therapy or in law enforcement. They were just so happy. Things seemed wonderful. They wanted very much to have children to share their love with. Everything seemed perfect. But then Elizabeth suffered two miscarriages. She and Richard struggled with the pain of seeing other couples walking with baby strollers and hearing parents complaining about being kept awake at night. And they wished with broken hearts for little cries that would keep them up at night. One January, Richard went horseback riding. He was thrown and knocked unconscious. He woke up. He drove himself to the hospital. They took x-rays, they had him swivel his neck around and said, oh, you're fine. But the pain grew worse. And he went to a specialist who took just one look at his x-rays and knew that something was very wrong. He had cracks in his vertebra. The doctor immediately put Richard in traction, told him not to move. There was a very real chance he could end up as a quadriplegic. A surgeon was flown in and surgery was performed. It was a success and over time, Richard got better. Then Elizabeth got pregnant again. The doctor ordered an amniocentesis test to be run and the results came back and the baby was diagnosed as having Down syndrome and Elizabeth and Richard were just devastated. Many of their friends didn't know exactly what to say. And then others said to them things like, people will be watching how you respond. And they were getting the message pretty clearly. Don't grieve. Don't look sad. 
Show how much faith you have. Is that the way we're supposed to handle our grief? Lock it up inside of us. Deny that it's real. Don't let it show. Losses come into the lives of all of us. And at times, the pain can seem unbearable. Somebody you love dies. Somebody that has meant so much to you says, it's over and walks out. The health and life you've taken for granted is suddenly fragile. You lose your job. The dream you've clung to for so long is shattered. One of the very first questions many people ask when they suffer a loss is this. Why me? How many of us have struggled with that question? Why? Why me? Why am I going through this? Did I do something wrong? Am I being punished? When we're really honest, we come to acknowledge that sometimes we bring suffering on ourselves. The way we choose to live can bring hurt into our lives. How we act in life eventually has consequences. Physically, we may choose not to take care of our bodies. We smoke, overeat, don't exercise, don't get proper rest, and after a while, our bodies pay for it. Relationally, we can make poor choices. We treat others badly. We're insensitive to their needs. We may even be abusive. And we wonder why we end up feeling so all alone. Sometimes, yes, we bring pain into our own lives, but not all the time. There are times when the hardest loss, the deepest suffering comes, and and for no apparent reason at all. It was nothing that we've done It just happens. We live with an illusion of control. We like to think we can protect ourselves from all hurt and all struggle. We like to think that if we're just good enough or if we're just smart enough, nothing bad will ever happen to us. We think somehow that we have the power to make life accident-proof, loss-proof, suffering-proof. But we don't have that power. Out of the blue, some disaster or disease or disappointment comes and we realize that life on this planet is incredibly fragile for every one of us, no matter who we are. None of us is all powerful. We're all vulnerable. There are those things we simply cannot control. Jerry Sitzer wrote a book called A grace disguised, how the soul grows through loss. In it, he told about the day he was driving his car. And a drunk driver plowed into him head on. Through no fault of his own, in an instant, he lost his wife, his daughter, and his mother. Three generations. And he did what many of us have done when we've suffered a traumatic loss. He replayed the scene in his mind a thousand times. What if I had left 10 seconds earlier or 10 seconds later? What if I had taken another route? How could such a horrible thing happen? He wrote about the terror of the randomness of it all. And he concluded that on this earth, there are things that happen and we will never know why. We can spend our whole lives and that question never gets answered. One day, another question struck him. Why not me? Why not me? Why should I assume that my life will never have suffering and hurt? I mean, am I a better person 
than the baby born to a starving family in sub-Saharan Africa? Why should I think I should be exempt? It's another unanswerable question. Why do we have the good fortune that we do? Do we think we somehow deserve it? If so, why? There's a question more important than why me or why not me. It's the question, how will I choose to respond? We need to focus on how we react when loss simply turns our world upside down. What are we to do? I want to be clear about what the Bible does not say to do. Don't pretend your loss doesn't hurt. Now, a lot of us grew up being taught that we ought to act as if it doesn't hurt when we experience loss, particularly those of us who are guys. We're to act like it doesn't affect us, you know, because that's supposedly a sign of strength. Don't believe that. Don't buy into that. There are even those who think that you get extra credit, you know, for being super spiritual if something catastrophic happens and you don't show that you're sad. You just take it in stride. You keep going as if it doesn't really bother you. In our society, there's a certain pressure not to grieve. It's almost like a game we play. There's this family who traveled on long trips. And the kids would sit in the back seat. And being kids, they'd get cranky. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I need to go to the bathroom. So the mom created what she thought was a wonderful game. It was the quiet game. The child who was quiet the longest when they played the game would get a prize. Oftentimes our culture is like that. We reward people for pretending they don't hurt. When they show how supposedly strong they are through their silence. Because it makes us uncomfortable. And we would just as soon avoid that. When people are sad and hurting. And they're asked how they're doing in our culture. The expectation is that they'll say, well, they're doing just fine. Even when they're not. We encourage people to just get on with their lives. Die right back in, get active, get busy, plunge into work, don't think about it, and maybe then the loss will somehow just go away. But trying to escape into busyness doesn't help in the long run. We may postpone our grief for a while, but it does not resolve it. It does not deal with it in a healthy way. And what often will happen is that to compensate, people will plunge into substance abuse or addictive behaviors or a buying spree or some destructive actions. Or they just may end up sitting depressed for hours and hours in front of the television. Trying to escape our losses is not what the Bible teaches. It teaches face your sadness and healthily express your anger and grief. Now, in the Bible, the psalmists do not hold back. They express their emotions. The most common type of psalm is called a psalm of lament. The psalmists tell God what they're really feeling. They express their hurt and their confusion. They may even get mad with God just like was talked about in the first video. Psalm 22, 1 says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have cried desperately for help, but still it does not come. They poured out their hearts to God. They knew God was not threatened in the least by our questions, by our expressing our grief and our pain and our anger. If you've been playing the quiet game with your grief for far too long, 
If you've had losses you've never mourned and tears you've never shed, I hope you'll start praying your feelings to God. God will listen. God cares. God does not expect us to pretend we can be real with God. And when you've suffered a loss, please, in your grieving, don't isolate yourself. Don't withdraw from other people. Don't become reclusive or hermit. Uh, There's this tendency in us that says, I don't want to ever go through pain like that again. I don't want to ever feel hurt like that again. So I'll just stay to myself. I won't let anyone get close to me. That way, no one will ever hurt me again. No one will ever disappoint me again. C.S. Lewis wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. If we isolate ourselves from others, we may think we are avoiding all risk. But in reality, if we refuse to be vulnerable, we're assuring we will never know the joy of love. So what are we to do in times of grief and sadness? Romans 12, 15 says, be happy with those who are happy. Be sad with those who are sad. We aren't to avoid people who are dealing with loss. We're to share in their grief with them. Now, that does not mean we're to give unsolicited advice. That does not mean We're to share our own theological explanations about why bad things happen. That does not mean we're not to tell them, well, you know, it really isn't that bad. It could have been worse. We're to mourn with them. We may give them a hug. We may say, I'm so sorry. We may say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. We're to grieve along with them because just being there can mean so much. In the midst of loss and grief, one of the questions asked over and over and over again is, where is God? Some people think that because there's loss and suffering, that means there's no God, that God doesn't exist. Others believe there is a God. But they question why God didn't make the kind of world where there would be no sadness, no heartache. Why didn't God just make things so everything was determined? Why couldn't God write out a script every day detailing what every person was going to say and do that day? Well, the only problem with that is that we wouldn't be human beings. We would be robots. We wouldn't be free to make choices. Now, we could go through life and never feel any pain. But then we'd never feel love either. God has in love created us to be free. And we can make choices that bring such joy. Or we can make choices that bring hurt and sadness. The kind of choices that break our hearts and break the heart of God too. And people misunderstand when they think of of God as cruel and hard-hearted. They think of God as being uncaring and sending death and destruction on the human race. The Bible says that death is the enemy of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, The last enemy... To be destroyed is death. Death was not God's original plan for human beings. And it's not God's final purpose for us either. God loves us so much that he sent his only son into the world to save us from the power of sin and evil. And and what happened? We human beings crucified Christ on the cross. He experienced an agonizing death. For us. So God understands our hurt. 
and our sorrows. In Jesus, God suffers with us. The message of the cross is that God is with us even in the darkest times, even when we don't understand, even when we're shaken and afraid, even when we hurt so badly we are not sure how we will survive. Jesus knew what this was like. He said, my heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. The God of the Bible is the God who suffers with and for the human race. Nicholas Waltersdorf taught at Yale University. And he wrote a book about the death of his son, Eric, who had a mountain climbing accident when he was age 25. And Waltersdorf wrote about how he could hardly bring himself to look at pictures of his son because it was just too painful. And he describes a time when he was finally able to start boxing up Eric's things so they could be put away. And Walter Stove said at that time, he began to understand the suffering of God. He wrote, maybe the greatest thing about God is that he would choose to suffer with us when he did not have to. God loves us that much. What helps us cope with our grief is the promise that ultimately God's love will prevail. Loss does not win out. Love wins out. Do you believe that? Do you really? Jesus said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. We will all know troubles and sadness. But we can take courage because God's love will finally triumph. You see, the day is coming when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The day is coming when there will be no more crying or pain or suffering. In the second video this morning, the woman who was devastated over her losses said she no longer had any hope. But for followers of Jesus, we believe that somewhere down the road, we ultimately will find the answers to our questions we'll find God's mighty arms of love just reaching out to us. And ultimately, we will see God face to face. And I pray that even in times of loss, we'll reach the place in our relationship with the Lord that we will embrace what the band sang about. Far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. Through it all, through it all, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's our hope. Friends, hold on to that. Would you pray with me?